well good morning everyone uh, we were discussing about the revolution a revolutionary change in the territory during the 1960s and earlier to this particular decade new criticism was dominating and we understood that the new critics emphasized on one correct interpretation of a text by adopting a prescribed methodology which was asserted by the new critics and these critics didn't pay much attention towards the historical context or the feelings beliefs and ideas of text readers I mean the readers were not uh, in their consideration at all they never understood uh, the readers role in the interpretation of the text okay they thought that uh, the text meaning is the part of its ambiguity irony and paradox uh, which is the part of its structure and while analyzing the text the new critics you know believe that an austere critic can identify a text central paradox and explain how the ultimately uh, the text ultimately resolve that paradox so i refer to clean books and his new criticism and even we talked about uh, you know uh, the works that he studies the paper which we studied in the last semester however the change took place in the late 1960s as hermeneutics was introduced by jack derrida and other similar thinking scholars and these new these critics unlike the new critics of the earlier decade you know uh, among whom derrida was the spoke person the chief spoke person for deconstruction disputes a text objective existence for them text cannot exist objectively they emphasize on the uh, historical context and the readers role in the interpretation in the hermeneutics so they denied that a text is an autotelic artifact so it cannot tell its own story on its own it is not autotelic as such okay so there is the challenges the accepted definitions and assumptions of both the reading and the writing processes okay and he insists on questioning what parts not only the text but also the reader and the author play in the interpretative process so the emphasis emphasis of these critics was on the role of the readers and derrida and other such critics like minded critics you know came one after one chronologically after modernism and structuralism in literary theory and these critics are called postmoderns or post structuralist okay structuralism was similar to new criticism but we have already studied todrow's views on the differences between structuralism and new criticism so you should revisit to understand this difference so new structuralism is in a way different from new criticism in its in its methodology in its approach so the term postist critic is also introduced recently apart from postmoderns and post structuralists we understood that you no know, they came after uh, what we call the so called modernism and the structuralism Uh, another term used is postic critics now this term is used to denote all these kind of thinkers postmodern thinkers so they include the philosopher critic like you know jonathan kuller j hales miller barbara johnson and michel foucault etc okay and uh, miss the these critics actually question the language of text and of literary analysis you know certain net examination such kind of questions are asked me so among the following is not the post modernist etc so you, you need to be familiar with all these names 
So, uh, unlike the new critics, means they adopted a different stand. These critics, uh, new critics, believe that the language of literature is somewhat different from the language of science and everyday conversation. We know it very well with reference to new, uh, Clint Brooks and Todra. So they try to establish the difference between uh, the language of literature and every everyday language. So unlike these critics, the postmodernists insist that the language of text is not distinct from the language used to analyze such writings. For them, language is a discourse that has to be noted. It is a discourse for the postmodernist. Language itself is a discourse. It itself is a story. Okay, it itself is a narrative for them. So the discourse or culturally bound language of ideas using literary analysis helps and form shape and form the text being analyzed. So language has its role to play in shaping and forming the text. Therefore, the language is also equally important. We cannot separate the text and the language used to critique it. Means the language of criticism is also very important. So for the postmodernists, postist critics, language helps create and shape what we call objective reality. Whatever mm, term we understand, we are familiar with objective reality. So this objective reality is created in terms of language and shaped by language. And they believed that objective reality cannot be created by language. Okay. Many postmodernists, Ms. earlier critics believed that language can help and create objective reality, but these critics, postmodernists, believed that language cannot create objective reality. So, by taking this stand, these critics assert that all reality is a social construct, just like uh, cultural studies. A culture is a social construct or construct. Means it is constructed in the society, in a given society. Reality itself is constructed in a given society. So, when we think from this perspective, from this point of view, we understand that there is no single or primary objective reality. Okay. Means many realities exist rather. So they uh, disown or uh, disown a universal objective reality. They don't believe in this universal objective reality. Because objective reality changes from society to society. Because reality is a social construct. Whatever is reality for Indians may not be the reality for uh, others. Or whatever the, is the reality for Maharashtrians may not be the reality for uh, the people of Karnataka. That we need to understand. So these critics believe that reality is perspectival. Now, for example, the dispute between, uh, between Maharashtra and Karnataka uh, for Belgaum is, you know, uh, going, has been going on for a long period. Now, whatever we think is a reality for us, but the people of Karnataka may have different perception. The politicians of Karnataka have different perception. So, uh, same in the case of India and Pakistan. So, the re there is no universal or objective reality with each individual creating his or her subjective understanding of the nature of reality itself okay critics believe that reality is perspectival with it with each individual because each individual creates his or her subjective understanding okay so this is how uh, we understand how there was a revolutionary change during the 1960s. So how then, if the reality is not objective, uh, then how do uh, how then do we come 
to agree upon public and social concerns. Then means how do we uh, agree upon values, ethics, and the common good if reality is different for each individual? That is the question that arises in our minds. So the answer for these postmodern thinkers is that each society a culture contains within itself a dominant cultural group. Who determines that cultural culture's ideology? Or we can use Gramsci's Antonio Gramsci's term, the hegemon. He was the Marx, uh, Marxist critic. So the hegemony, hegemony is what? Uh, its dominant values, its sense of right and wrong, and sense of personal self worth. Uh, means all uh, kind of things are determined by the dominant cultural group. So all people in a given culture are consciously and unconsciously asked to conform. Therefore, there are disputes. Okay, in for example, in in India itself, there are disputes over what is reality and what is not. So it is a kind of hegemony, and the minorities and other groups have to confirm and if they don't confirm then conflicts arise so what happens when one's ideas one's thinking or one's personal background does not confirm now for example uh, in india we have this conflict a battle between hindus and muslims because of this kind of you know uh, non conformity not only Hindus and Muslims, within Hindu, Hindu itself there are again conflicts because of non-conformity. Okay, uh, I often give an example of a poem by uh, V.S. Kumar. The title of the poem is The Vinous Plaint. I shall write, just quote some lines from the poem uh, to make you understand what these critics are trying to say. Uh, listen to these lines carefully. Going for my passport, going for my passport, they call me Indian abroad. Going by my passport, they call me Indian abroad. In Britain, I am a woke. In America, I am minus red. In South Africa, I am something, you know, they, he, uh, he keeps on telling the names. Indians are known by different names in different countries. Going by my passport, when they look at my passport, they call me Indian abroad in a foreign land. I am an Indian outside India. But okay, when I come to my own country, in my own land, I don't know who I am. The poet says, in my own land, I don't know who I am. Beyond the Vindyas, no, Vindya mountains, mountain range. Beyond the Vindyas means in North India. Beyond the Vindyas, I am a Saudi or more often a Madrasi. So, South Indian people are generally called Madrasi in North India. North India means in Maharashtra, Gujarat, and other parts of India, UP, etc. No, I'm not going for the exact geographical division. I'm talking about uh, Vindya ranges, beyond the land beyond Vindya uh, ranges. I am Saudi or Madrasi. In Madras, I am a Malayali. So can you see how the meaning changes? How uh, the the perception changes? In Madras, I am a Malayali. Do tell me who I am, the poet asks. Then he says, to the Muslims, I am a Hindu. To the Muslims, I am a Hindu. And to the Hindus, I am Brahmin or some other caste name. Do tell me who I am. So these lines throw light on this particular ideology, how meaning is not stable, how meaning is perspectival, 
how meaning is determined by the background of the people so that has to be understood now for example when the dominant culture consists of white anglo saxon males or one is a black female what happens then if the dominant culture consists of white anglo saxon males and one is a black female or how does one respond to a culture dominated by white males if one is a native american a red indian so these are the questions so for people of color living in africa or in the Amer in the americas north and uh, latin america or native americans for native americans for females and for gays and lesbians and a host of others the traditional answer already has been articulated by the dominant class who the white people and it is accompanied hegemony accompanying hegemony what is that silence live quietly work quietly think quietly so this is the message sent to these others when you go in america we think that america is a conflict free society it's not like that so these others are there are africans or lesbians lesbians females so all these are others and this message is sent to the others live quietly work quietly think quietly by the dominant culture so the message this the message sent to these others by the dominant culture has been clear and consistent what is that conform conform is agree live accept the rules and be quiet deny yourself and all will be well but the problem is that all cannot be quiet so writers and thinkers such as tony morrison tony morrison is an american negro writer or uh, african american writer alice walker gabriel uh, gracia marcus carlos shintius gayatri spivak chakraborty edward said said sorry and franz fanon judith butler these are some of the names they have dared to speak out and challenge the dominant cultures okay and the dictates these cultures decree miss the orders or the control of this these cultures have been challenged they continue to refuse silence and choose defiance whenever necessary so these writers believe that an individual's view of life of values and ethics really matters okay so this is how miss you understand the challenge the non conformity so these writers speak for not one culture but many not one cultural perspective but a host not one interpretation of life but countless they they speak for the oppressed suppressed and silenced you need to understand underline these words they speak for the oppressed suppressed and silenced so while speaking this critic scholar african scholar um, australian native american female gay and lesbian are making themselves heard among the cacophony of the insistent dominant and generally o point culture so they are trying to assert their voices they are trying to speak they are making themselves to be heard so these are the divergent groups and these groups you know uh, what we call outside the britain or uh, the usa north america in great britain so in great britain it is called cultural criticism we saw stuart hall our cultural studies in north america this criticism primarily focuses on textual analysis and artistic forms 
and in culture the cultural study refers to a much broader interdisciplinary study we are familiar with this okay so what we are going to understand here is post colonialism what post colonialism is so with this background we shall go ahead with a discussion on post colonialism 